hi. <laughs> my name is Elizabeth. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm really glad you're here because I read a book by Matt Shaw. Mm, oh my gosh. It, it's not Hub. Not ready to discuss. Well, I did read Hub, but I'm not ready to discuss it. <laughs> this is Happily Ever After by Matt Shaw. And, um... As spoiler-free as I can do it, there are two characters in this um, book. One is a uh, predator and one is a kidnap victim. And the entire thing takes place in his home um, because he has kidnapped her. Um, and it's it's literally the two of them the entire time. There's no other I mean, other characters are mentioned, you know. Um, but we only ever have the interactions or thoughts of these two. And, um, it's one of those, like, where it's not every other chapter, but certainly by the time we get to the end, it's every other chapter from their each perspective. Um, and it's a pretty quick read, um, which is good with Matt Shaw's books because they're <laughs> rough. Um, and... This one is actually one that you can get through Amazon. There are some of Matt Shaw's books that you can't even purchase. The only way you can purchase them is directly from his website. <laughs> kind of makes you feel icky <laughs> doing it. But um, but this one I actually got from Amazon, So and I read it on um, my Kindle. So um, But that's about as spoiler-free as I can be. Um, but I'm going to tell you the entire sordid, disturbing, awful story that came from the mind of Matt Shaw. So, join me for the ride. Okay, we have two characters, Peter and Vanessa. And what we find out from Peter is that he first saw Vanessa when he was at the bank. She's a bank teller. And he would um, always make sure to manipulate his place in line so that, like, she was the one that was helping him. Um, one time she was really um, rude to him, and he thought, oh, she's the worst. But then he saw her again, and he realized she's actually pretty nice. She's just, it must have been a bad day. Um, and, which is how he first sees her. She first sees him while she does know him as a customer from the bank. Um, she wakes up in his, in a, a room in his basement. Uh, shackled, hands shackled, feet shackled to a bed in a room that um, doesn't really have a whole lot in it. And um, the first thing he does is he asks her if they were the only two people left on the entire planet. Like it was just the two of them. Does she think ever in any sort of way could she ever see herself actually loving him and actually being with him if he, the, they were the last two. And because she's trying really hard to save her own life because she's shackled to a bed in the basement of some strange home, she says yes. And so begins the love story. Sorry, it's really hard for me to call this a love story, but so begins the love story. Well, it's brought to you from the, the hell and dark mind of Matt Shaw. So, you know what you kind of know what you're in for here. Um, so, I'm sorry, I didn't give any trigger warnings. This is all about abuse. This is all about terrible, terrible abuse. Um, so, <laughs> warning. <laughs> be careful. I discuss disturbing things, and therefore, you should be careful when you watch my stuff. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Again, I giggle because it's uncomfortable, um, not because it's in any way funny. Okay, so um, he um, he drugs her to get her into his house, um, and um, and it's at their first meal that he asks her this question, um, and when she says yes, he is astonished because this is the this is the answer he's been waiting for, and he has not gotten this answer from anyone else which is a pretty clear way of saying that he's done this before. So, um, <laughs> he's so creepy. So, um, and, and they're, it's their, their first dinner and it's all through seen through his eyes and he's thinking to himself, I wonder which way her head's going to fall when, when the drugs finally kick in. Like, will her face fall onto her food, which would be so exciting and awesome for him. He would think that was great. Or, or is her head just going to fall back or, 
Like, that's what he's thinking about. As she's like, please let me go. I don't know why I'm here. Please let me go. This is this is terrible. I, I, I miss my mother and father. Do you know who I am? Please let me go. I just, whatever you need, whatever you want, please let me go. You know, because she is being held against her will. So he is the strangest character because he totally removes a woman from the world, forcefully drugging her. And then when he's in her company, he's like, strangely respectful kind of so after she passes out at the table he picks her up and he carries her um does he carry her down the stairs or up the stairs and um he thinks to himself her dress is sort of riding up as i try to get her up the stairs i hope i get a peek I hope you get a peek dude you're in complete control you could do literally whatever you want with her you shouldn't you should let her go but in his mind, he's thinking, I'd love to get a little peek, but I, I can't look because that wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be organic. That wouldn't be real. So this guy really does believe that if he just keeps this woman in his ownership, that the two of them will fall in love and have a wonderful life together because he is a very, very lonely, 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 disturbed character. He tells her that um, eventually... She's going to get free reign of the house, but for right now, he can't trust her, and until he does, she's going to have to stay shackled, But um, and that there is one room that she's... There's actually two rooms she's not allowed in, um, and we discover that one of them is, like, his media room, so he has the whole house all wired up, especially her room, so that he can be in there and watching whatever it is she's doing in the house without sitting in the room with her. And she knows this. She can tell that there's a camera. She can tell. She can hear when it when it whirs and therefore is zooming in or whirs because it's moving or what have you. Um, but our Peter waxes, you know, poetically, but not very, um, about his past other girlfriends and um, and things he's learned. Like, for instance, he's upstairs with her body, or downstairs with her body, and he thinks to himself, I know, now know how to turn over an unconscious body the right way. If you just try to pull it over and the one arm gets stuck and you have to make sure that you... Oh, he's definitely done this before. And then he thinks to himself, well... That one, that one where I learned how to turn the, um, or the bodies over, she was the first girl to take up residence in my garage. Uh, by the way, the garage is the other room that, um, our sweet Vanessa is not allowed in if she ever actually gets freedom of the house. Um, our Vanessa wakes up. She's had that one, um, meal she hasn't eaten, but she was drugged and asked if she could love him. He said yes. So when she wakes up, she just starts screaming and screaming get me out of this room get me um out of this house let me go why do you want me why did you pick me what's going on you know all of that um and he's thinking to himself oh i just wish we were past all of this already i have to go through all of this and like the convincing her that this is the place that she's gonna be and this is where she lives and this is her only way you know her, her future is going to be with me and, and I can't wait till I get to move her into my master bedroom and we can cuddle all night. I mean, this guy's so delusional. So delusional. So um, he says, you know, it's time for some more food. She says she doesn't want food. She just wants to go home. She just wants to, to you're like, what do you mean what food do I want? I don't want food. I want you to let me go. And um, she screams so loud that she uh, she gets so angry with him that she ends up um, spitting in his face. And it's like this mild-mannered guy who is trying everything he can to get this girl to really care about him flips. And he gets really mad. Really mad. And he spits in her face. And he tells her that they're going to need to have a little chat which is when he spits at her again, but this time on the other cheek. And he explains that um, she's the first only girl who ever answered yes to his question. Every other girl has said, no, I couldn't possibly love you. It doesn't matter if we were the last people on earth. 
you said yes. Had you answered no, you'd be gone. I, I would have let you go from here, there, but, but there's no going back. You said yes. This is the way forward. There is no going back. And she says, well, if that's true and this is my home, then why am I tied up to this bed? And that's when she gets the rules of living with Peter. Um, while there is no trust, she will be kept shackled to the bed. That's it. As trust begins to grow, she will have the restraints removed like one at a time. So like maybe she'll get her right hand free or she'll get her left foot free or maybe she, at one point she'll have both feet and a hand free. Um, but it's going to be slow and the shackles are going to be removed one at a time, right? And um, she's really got to prove to him and that she's trustworthy, that she's not going to try to run. That and he said when they fully connect as a couple, they will move all of her things into the master bedroom. She will have full reign of the house. They will just be together, except for the, this one room that she's not allowed to go in. Um, and then he says to her, I'm going to give you a couple hours to think about things. Of course, he returns 23 minutes later because he has no patience. And she apologizes. Oh, our Vanessa's smart. Oh, our Vanessa is not an idiot. She hears what he says. And so she apologizes. I didn't think, Peter, I'm so sorry. I'm just so shocked to be in this situation. And, you know, and I really, I, I miss my parents. And, you know, this is just, it's very strange for me, but I really, I didn't think about how all the work that you put in to, to make this place, you know, nice for me. And, and I really, I really do, you know, appreciate it. And that he had put a flower on her, her breakfast tray. And so she thanks him for the flower, you know, that she had totally ignored before. Um, and Peter gets hopeful because he's in, because he's not the smartest. Um, <laughs> At this point, he says he can take her to the bathroom to get freshened up because at this point, you know, she's been spit on and she's passed out twice and she's, you know, she hasn't eaten in a long time and she's, she's just sort of a mess. And um, he allows her to go into the bathroom and he sits right outside the door. Um, he has this really sick thought about how lovely it is, how lovely it is that she can't go anywhere, that he's got her that she can't go anywhere that he doesn't allow. She's, he's got control over her and where she goes. And it's lovely. This is when we start to hear Vanessa work out a plan to try to get out. How can I manipulate this guy and get the control back, right? How can she get the upper hand? This is her new goal. You know, it's not to yell and scream at him. It's not to um, punch and kick at him. It is to try to manipulate him, get his trust, figure out how she can get out of this situation. So um, she's really, really polite, right? So she's in the bathroom and she's like, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't find the soap. Can you tell me where the soap is? And then, you know, oh, I found it. Thank you so much. And then she says like, well, what is it you wanted to do today? And, you know, and he tells her that he's got books and he's got board, board games and she said movies. And she suggests, you know, let's just talk. Don't you want to get to know each other? And um, She's pretty sure he's walked away from the bathroom door. So she thinks, this is my chance. I'm gonna try to open the window in the bathroom. Mm. Bathroom window is bricked in. Okay, sure, this is gonna be the bathroom that she's allowed to use. That's why it's bricked in. I get it. Um, that stinks. Um, when he catches her, she says, oh, I was just hoping to get something warm to drink because she can see that he's got a cup of tea for her. Right? So he's like, oh, she's like, oh, you read my mind. That's exactly what I was looking for, you know. He's not sure. And he says, well, do you need sugar? And she says, you don't think I'm sweet enough? So now she's like flirting with him. She's like playing a little game with him. And um, after a, a little bit of, of working on her courage, she um, is able to ask him, why me? With a little pushing, she finds out that she is now his 15th prisoner, okay? Um, he tells her that she, he let the others go, which is not true, but to him, he let them go. So what letting them go was, was 
ending their lives and putting them in the garage. Um, there's lots of times that he either goes into the garage or he passes by the garage and he's like, mm, maybe I should spray it up a little bit or maybe the smell's not so great at the moment. So at that point, he um, he's given her the tea and she's just gotten out of the bathroom. So she's, you know, showered and whatnot. And, um, and he says, you know, there's clothes, there's a whole wardrobe of clothes for you and there's also shoes and, you know, and she thanks him profusely because she's trying to get him to like her. And um, when she sits down on the bed, she hears the zooming in of the camera. And so she decides to um, play with herself for, for him. And at one point she looks into the camera and she says, do you like what you see? You know, like she's totally playing into this, like, can I get you to trust me? I'm falling in love with you faster than you thought I could, you know, kind of thing. Um, while she's doing this, he crashes into the room, removing his shirt, like as he's coming towards her. And she says, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not ready for that. I'm just, I'm so grateful to have had, to have only one hand shackled that I, I just, I really wanted to thank you. And he's clearly disappointed, but he stops himself and he says, well, I, 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 I just, I wanted you to know that I was starting dinner. That's, that's the only reason I came in. So at this point, our poor Vanessa thinks to herself, oh, <laughs> I am going to be free by tonight. This is going to be easy. It's, it's not easy. For those of you who don't know who Matt Shaw is, um, it's just not is there's not gonna be happy things happening in this book again. The laughter is because it's so uncomfortable. Um, so we um, we get ourselves back to his point of view, and we're at dinner, and he about he uh, he apologizes for embarrassing her because he came in while she was you know doing what she was doing, and um, and she thinks you know okay I'm I'm I need to be back to playing this game, and and she's she's full in it. The fi the smile that she gives him is is beautiful and totally fake and all manipulation, but yet he um, and he knows it. He can tell because we're in his brain right now. And he's like, oh, that's a fake smile. Oh, this is manipulation. Um, he offers to let her out, be out of three shackles that evening, um, even though he also knows in his mind he'll never, ever do it. This is only the however many nights. He's not going to trust her to only be in one shackle. But he sort of makes that offer. When she um, changes the conversation at dinner, he's he's really relieved because it's all about, like, when can I go and what are the rules and my, I miss my parents and do you think I can see my parents, whatever. And um, he makes a point about how um, he keeps having to... Matt Shaw must be from England. or He is from England. But because um, he says, you know, I, I can't believe how much food I've had to bin. Like, I've, I've wasted so much food because I've made food for her and put it out and she won't eat it because she's been kidnapped and she's terrified. And... I, under duress, it's very hard to eat until your like your body is like, no, I have to have food or I'm going to not work anymore. So, um, so he's all like, she better eat this time because you know, there is an infinite amount of food here. There is only so much we've got. Foreshadowing anyone? Foreshadowing? I believe we found some foreshadowing. <laughs> um. Uh, she asks um, if they can open some of the shades because she misses sunlight. And she says, you know, she gets a little sad when she doesn't get to see the sun. And if we could just open a window so that he can see, she can see the sunlight, that would be lovely. And he says, no, absolutely not. That is not something that's going to happen. Um, you know, fresh air is not going to happen. Sunlight is not going to happen. I am not opening any of the windows because he knows that she's just trying to figure out a way. Like if there's a window, then there's a way out. Right. Uh, she pushes for fresh air. He says it's not needed, um, that they only need each other because that's always where he falls back to. Um, but to this, she pushes back um, and she says, well, we're going to have to leave at some point. I mean, we're going to have to go to the grocery store. At, at, which, at which point he says, oh, the food will last. And then he thinks to himself, well, <laughs> the food's not really going to last forever, but they'll be bonded by them and they'll just starve to death together. It'll be romantic and beautiful. They're gonna starve together? 
Mm -hmm. We got a little more uh, foreshadowing here, people. Um, when at one point at dinner, she says she thinks she smells something unpleasant, and he thinks to himself, "Oh, I'm gonna have to respray the garage." Hmm, respray the garage, huh? <laughs> he thinks to himself that he should probably never tell her where his her parents are, because they're in her garage, his garage. Matt Shaw just drops it on us as part of his thought process. Like, you know, they're in his garage. So, so we get a little background information here. So, um, he says he always researches the fan, the, the, the life of the girl that he's, um, stalking and, and looking to kidnap because he has to know who's going to notice when that person is gone. Right. So he always looks into like who are their close friends, who do they work with, who, you know, which part of their family, you know, turns out that this woman, even though she's like 23, 24, she lives with her parents because she's out of college, but she's trying to, you know, get some money together and then she's going to go out on her own, hopefully. And, um, but she really loves her parents and, um, and they have a great relationship and she's like thrilled to be living with them. They're thrilled to be living with her. So or her to be living with them. So um, he realizes that there's really only one way that he can um, kidnap her and successfully, and that is to get rid of her parents as well. So um, he follows them, I believe, like, un like the night before or the night after he takes her, like really close. Like they don't know that she's missing it. And, um, and he follows them. They go out one night. They, she, he discovers that for the most part, they're totally devoted to their daughter, not necessarily to each other. And, but on Wednesdays, they seem to go out. So he follows them on a Wednesday. Um, they go down this, you know, pretty deserted street to somewhere. He's not sure where, but, um, he stops his car on the, the abandoned road, seeing that they're pulling over up ahead and he waits for them. He waits something like three or four hours just waiting for them and they come back and he's got his car flashers on and he waves them down please I need help I need help in my big car and it's terrible and I need a nice person and um he stabs them both and he kills them both and he puts them in the back of their Mercedes and then he drives their Mercedes home to his house and puts it in the garage with the 14 other girls that are also in his garage or well We'll get to that. So at this point, um, he starts to tell us about himself because he's super bummed that Vanessa is still in the restraints. He was hoping that by now she would have free reign at, you know, and that they would be cuddling on the couch, discussing her, their childhoods. Well, her childhood, not his childhood. I mean, he is the bastard child of a whore who provided her son with his first memory being that of her being with a man who's not his father, most likely. Um, and then as he got older, there were times when she would um, allow him to be brought into the process so that he she could make more money. Um, or, you know, however, whatever it is the customers wanted with him. And he says how he tried to run away at one point, um, but that he realized he had nowhere to go that like he, he still needs food and education and a roof over his head. So he turns around and goes back and um, it isn't until social services sort of figure out what's going on with him when he's an you know older student. Um, he gets taken out of that environment. Okay. And then he gets put into foster homes where he's treated terribly. And um, he thinks about what his mom and those men he saw her with had and how it wasn't love. But that what, what he and Vanessa have, that's love. Um, that evening, he, she's, um, she's asking about her parents too much. She really wants to see her parents. If you're my boyfriend, I want you to meet my parents. Like, they're really important in my life. And I'm, I, I can't live my rest of my life without seeing them. And it really stresses him out. And he knocks her out again. So um, when she's unconscious next, she says, look, I'm obviously making you unhappy with certain things that I'm doing or saying, but if all you're going to do to tell me that I'm doing something wrong is knock me out, I'm never going to learn. Um, I can't be educated while I'm unconscious. So before you're at the point where you want to 
drug me so that I'm unconscious. Can you warn me somehow? And that way I can learn. Because if you're telling me this is the only life I have in front of me, the only option of a life that I have, then um, I want to make you as happy as possible so that I can make me as happy as possible. Which all makes good logical sense. And he's like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be as suspicious of her as I thought. So he agrees um, to let her out of the restraints so she can go to the bathroom. Um, and she um, he sits outside the bathroom door expecting her to try to run away again. And she doesn't at all in any way and so um she <laughs> she models um the dress that he she that he chose for her and she's acts all grateful about the new wardrobe the, the dress he makes her put on she flipping hates but makes a big deal about oh this is so nice and look at how so great i look and whatever um he um he hopes for a day when she will wear his favorite the red dress i think she's in a blue dress right now he mentioned shoes. She tells him that, oh my gosh, he thought of everything. Her shoes are right. Her clothes are great. She's dated lots of men in the past, but they never got her, her size right. He's got it perfect. You know, compliments, cater to the ego, make him happy, right? At this point, they start to share a little bit about each other with each other. So she says that her parents were actually... Um, they were killed and she was adopted by foster parents. So the parents that she has now, the mom and dad that she misses and she wants to see and everything, they're actually her foster parents and they, they ended up adopting her. Um, he tells her that his mom was a whore who sold him and abused him and beat him and he gets tears in his eyes and she comforts him and she kisses him and it's believable. He tells her, you know what? The restraints aren't needed anymore. We're good. At which point we cut to her point of view, which is awesome. Because she's like, these clothes are so hideous. His tongue is so gross. He smells awful. She would have loved to have just, like, not be anywhere near him. Like, all of the clothes, especially if they're new, she just wants to take them all into town and exchange them for decent ones. And, um, like, she hears him returning and she fakes being, like, really impressed with the wardrobe, you know. And at this point, she offers to um, put on the red dress. And this leads to their first um, sexual experience, their first, his first rape of her, really. That's what's going on here. Even though she's trying to convince him that it's, you know, it's also something that she wants. Uh, she thinks that she's going to have the upper hand, and he, um, he makes sure that she's shackled during it, so... She doesn't have the upper hand, but she's hoping that there will be a time when she will be, like, in this same position, but not shackled. So, um, and he literally thinks, says, and believes that she is falling for him. That she, this is it. This is actually working. Oh, my gosh. So, she asks, asks to um, freshen up, and he says, oh, you roam freely. You are welcome to go anywhere you, you want. And she thinks, oh. I'm in control again. This is great. Awesome. Brings her, he, he, she r runs a bath. He brings her tea. He promises to show her around the house. She pretends to be excited. Um, when he brings her the tea, he doesn't really even look at her body in the, in, in the bath. He's very respectful and sweet. And like, Peter thinks, oh my goodness, this is what true love is like. This is just the greatest thing ever. And at one point he thinks to himself, you know what? Even the garage smells completely lemony, smet, fresh. You know, lemony fresh scent because I use the whole can in there. And then he offers to move her into the main bedroom, into the master bedroom. And her response is, oh, can I? <laughs> She's, she does such a good job. Like, what a great response. Can I? <laughs> Because, you know, obviously she's like, this is disgusting and gross and I need to figure out how to get out of here. Um, but in showing... Uh, so then he shows her around and it's funny because he's like, I showed her around, but I only have like three rooms to show her. So it's not like there's a whole bunch to show around. But what she discovers in the tour is that everything is bolted down. The, the, um, the chairs, the couch, the beds, the, the coffee table, everything is bolted down to the ground. And she's like, what, what's the deal with this? Like, what's going on? Like, I I'd really love to move some things around and make it more feng shui or whatever. And he's like, no, 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 I have OCD. Everything has to be exactly where it is, which is why I did that. It's it's a part of my OCD. And the only way that I knew I could deal with having someone else in my space is knowing that they 
actually physically couldn't move things around. Um, when she says, um, when she asks what's in the garage, what's behind that door, that other locked door, because, you know, you said that was your media room, but what's this one? He says, oh, that's the garage. It's just, it's where we keep the rubbish. And he thinks to himself, well, that's not a lie. That is where we keep the garbage. She says that she is floored by the amount of food stuff he has. I mean, it is piled high throughout the kitchen. Like, there's a maze you've got to go through in the house to try to figure out, you know, to get to the different rooms because of how many, how much food stuffs he has. And he says, oh, it's because I wanted to make sure that I had whatever you might want to eat, you know, because I'll, I'll have it. You know, I reassure you don't have to worry about it. I'm sure I have it. Um, and that's when he goes off to have a shower and she goes off to put her things in the master bedroom. Um, so this is when she thinks that she has a chance to get out the front door. But it's locked. And Peter catches her. I got to this point in the story and I was like, no, she's done all this work. And now he thinks that she's trying to get away. Oh, God. So um, after he catches her, it cuts to him... Um, looking at the bruise on her eye and wondering if maybe he hit her too hard. And how interesting it is that um, he, the piece of meat that he has put on her face, you know, uh, to stop the swelling because it's cold, um, is really part of her mom. And, you know, moms take care of kids, so her mom's still taking care of her. The way Matt Shaw just, like, drops this information, like... He, it's so nice that a mom gets to comfort us and your mom is still comforting you. She wakes up and she just over and over and over and over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just want to see my parents. I miss my parents. I want to see my parents. It, that's the only reason that I'm doing these things. Don't take it personal. This is this is about me missing my parents. And his response to her is, your parents are dead. And her response to that is, I know, I know, my foster parents. I'm talking about my foster parents. And I think in that moment, he was trying to say, oh, no, no, I've killed your parents. There's no... But she reads it wrong, and he just goes with it. Um, she tries to tell him, like, if I'm really going to have a girlfriend, if I mean, if I'm really going to be your girlfriend, if you're, I'm really going to have a boyfriend, I want my parents to meet you. Like, this is, like, if we're going to have a life together, then this is part of how it has to go. And, um, and he's livid. The rage is bad. And he pulls her to a um, door jam. And he puts her foot in the door jam. And um, when she says, I just want to see my parents, <laughs> he says, I just want a girlfriend who won't run away. And slams the door onto her ankle. Her ankles are really, really fragile. It just, it smacks of um, misery, the movie and the book. Um, more the movie. But, and it's like, you can see it if you've seen Misery. You can see that happening to her foot and it's just terrible. So she is just, she just starts to scream. And he thinks, well, it's her fault. I only did what she made me do. This is not my fault. I told her not to run, not to leave, not to try anything. And she did. So this is the only way. This is how I have to teach her. She can't run. And we're listening to his train of thought. It's really interesting. You know, when I served her as tuna steak the other night, it really, it really did taste like steak. I remember Susie tasting more like fish. Which again, is Matt Shaw just dropping some information like, oh, he's been feeding her mother to her. That's why he doesn't think they're gonna run out of food because he's got bodies. Plenty of food in the garage. <laughs> Gross. Once she's awake um, and able to actually speak coherently and not whimper, cry, moan, and because of how much pain she's in, she explains that she's just trying to make this relationship real. That 
What she wants is to sleep in the same bed with him. What she wants is to cuddle him. What she wants is to play games with him, to chat with him, to get to know him. And them meeting his, and him meeting her parents is a big, big part of that. He's like standing in the doorway and she's of course shackled to the bed. And she says, please come to, you know, I, I feel like you hate me and, 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 you know, you don't love me anymore. And I just want you to come, you know, comfort me, just hold me. He doesn't want to come in the room. She's like, please, please. She begs him. She's begging him to come hold her. And, um, and she's like, you know, I, I want to hold you back. And he said, I'm not uncuffing your hands. And she says, that's fine. I understand. You know, I, you don't trust me. And, but this is all I was trying to do. And his thoughts go back to the garage and he thinks, you know what, we should make sure that Vanessa's mom doesn't go to waste. So he comes back um, to get her for dinner. She can't make her way down the hall because she can't put any, any, any weight on her one, you know, leg, ankle, foot, whatever. Um, so he has to carry her and she hates it. Um, when he puts her down at her seat, she sees that there's an envelope on her plate, clearly for her. And um, it's an apology note that she's able to read when he goes to finish getting re getting the rest of dinner and bringing it back to the table. And it's just, you know, I wouldn't want to hurt you. And um, I'm really sorry that, that things went the way they did. And, and we'll, we're con going to continue. It's a rough road, but we'll get there, you know, all that. And he offers to take her to her parents that night and she is beyond shocked and she tries to play it cool she tells him she didn't understand before that what he what needs what that what he needs and what needs to be happening right now is just the two of them that not having her parents in her life will be really hard but she's understanding now why it is that he wants it to just be the two of them she tells him that she loves him and she wants to be with him. And this is a shock to him because he was sure that she would accept going to see the parents and then, you know, know that he would, they, she would never come back with him. They spend their first night together in the bed, like sleeping, like the whole night. And um, he does shackle her wrists to the bed. She's trapped again. She feels like, oh, I'm not. When am I going to get control again? When am I going to be in charge again? Um, and uh, she, he wakes up blissful in the morning because there she is and she's his dream. And he, she wakes up grumpy. She's like, what? What do you want? Huh? Like, <laughs> and he's like, oh, she must not be a morning person. So she asks for toast for breakfast. And um, he goes to take care of it and then realizes my refrigerator is in the garage. And if I'm going to put butter on her toast, I need to go into the garage <laughs> and get the butter. And he left the bedroom door unlocked. So is it safe to go into the garage? He thinks to himself, maybe I need more freshener. This is the first time he thinks, maybe he didn't think everything through perfectly to make sure that it would all work. But... When he returns to her with the toast, um, she seduces him. She tells him it's her turn to take the lead in the bedroom department. He is thrilled. Um, and this part of the book is like little snippets of their thoughts back and forth. So it's like... Um, her thoughts are justified to the right and his thoughts are justified to the left and it's just bouncing back and forth is really cool because huh? it's really intense because like you know he's like oh this is just so this is everything I've ever dreamed of and she's like this is disgusting <laughs> this is the worst thing I've ever done I hope it works you know so um it's it's very cool um she doesn't want to put her mouth on him and then he begs and she answers well if you insist because she's trying to be all seductive right she grabs a hold of him firmly makes eye contact with him and bites down as hard as she can. <laughs> Sorry, a sadistic little laugh, but you go, girl. <laughs> Sorry. But I mean, like, you go, girl. Um, so she watches him. He just, like, writhes in pain. You know, she spits it out. She spits all over him. She takes his keys. She tells herself she did it. She's free. But she's still upstairs. 
with a, you know, potentially broken ankle, if not like tendons and muscles ripped and whatnot. So um, she's like, okay, <laughs> I'm done with him, right? And I got to get downstairs. And she realizes um, that she's only got underwear on. But she decides she doesn't care. Whoever it is that she's going to run into out there is going to give her a jacket, a shirt, a something. It doesn't matter. She just needs to get to freedom. When she finally goes to the, gets to the front door, which takes forever because she's injured. And, you know, it's getting down the stairs and the whole thing is just really difficult for her. And she finally gets to the front door, you know, gets herself up and finds the right key and puts the key in the door and opens it and... It's bricked in. All of the doors and all of the windows are bricked in. Everything. There is no way out of this house. So she takes the keys and says, thanks. Well, I've got the keys. Let's see what's in these other doors. And where does she go first? The garage. Why does the garage smell the way that it smells? She doesn't turn the light on, but she realizes that there are bodies on the ground and she closes her eyes and the way that it's described that like she puts her foot down and she knows it's on a person and not the ground, but she won't look. And then she like tr takes another step and tries to, oh, she's trying to like find the floor, whatever. And she makes her way over to the car and opens her eyes and thinks, I know that make and model. I know that license plate. I know that scratch on the bonnet. This is her parents' car. And she finds them. And she says that the pain in her ankle completely disappears because the pain in her heart is so much worse. And she kisses both of them. And she tells them that she loves them. And she's crying. And she gets into the driver's seat. And the keys are in the ignition. And she goes, rock on. I'm going to get out of here. My parents' car is going to get me out of here. But the car won't turn over. It's been completely disabled. So she heads back upstairs and back to the computer room and the other locked door. And on the way, she calls to Peter to see if he's going to respond. And he doesn't seem to respond. She doesn't go check on him, but it's good enough that he's not responding. And um, she gets into the, she gets herself into the computer room, but the computer is password protected. But as she's looking around this room, she realizes a lot of the stuff in this room is not bolted down. Because there are no weapons in the house. There isn't, there aren't axes, hammers, tools of any kind. Um, there is, and, and everything that has any heft or weight that she might be able to like throw at bricks. I don't know, throwing anything at a brick would make it come down. But, you know, even the chance of it, like, there's nothing. But here, now she's got seven monitors sitting in front of her. And she's like, okay, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. Oh, no, eight monitors. I'm sorry, eight monitors. And she is going to take those take them downstairs to the front door, and she's going to use them to destroy the brick wall. And they don't even make a dent. All eight, completely shattered, destroyed, ruined, make not even a scratch in the bricks. She finds a box full of plastic cutlery. So like those, those little, um, like they're little plastic bags and they have the fork, the knife, the spoon, all of them in there. There's a whole box of them. Apparently, that's what he was going to be using. Um, and she, she tear, you know, tears this open. She gets the knife out. You know, and those little white plastic knives, like, are, there's no strength to them. Um, but she takes one and she rubs it across the concrete in between the bricks. And a little dust comes away. And she thinks, well, this might take a really long time this is going to work. And this is how I'm going to get out. And I just need to be patient and keep working. And at that point, she hears Peter's voice say, why did you have to leave me? He's dead. She checks. He's dead. He's 100% dead. D-A-D, -D, dead. 
and he's talking to her. Hallucinations. He uh, he convinces her to rest, and the book ends with the two of them saying goodnight to each other. Now, <laughs> there is a sequel. I have just started reading it, so as soon as I know what happens, I will share with you all. Um, this was, oh God. <laughs> Matt Shaw knows how to write an edge of the seat, edge of your seat page turner that shocks you. Um, and that's what this did. And like I said, I am reading the, um, the sequel. Apparently there are now six books in this, um, uh, series or there, there's a total of six books in the series and it's, um, called like a man named Peter. So this one is the first one. And then the next one is, um, from what I understand, it's like the story of Vanessa after this. And then we start to get some of the background stories, um, of Peter. And I'm not sure I'm going to want to know more about Peter, but I definitely want to know what happens with Vanessa stuck in this house with, well, I guess 15 bodies. No, if there's 14 girls and him, that's 15 plus his, her parents. So it was 17 bodies and all of the, anyway, uh, <laughs> this book made me gasp, laugh, shout hooray, and go, uh, gross. Um, so, I had a, I actually had a pretty good time reading it. Um, uh, Matt Shaw writes some stuff that involves children that's really disturbing, and this didn't involve children, so I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated that. <laughs> so, that is Happily Ever After by Matt Shaw. Um, if you, uh, if you enjoyed this at all, please give me a thumbs up or uh, subscribe if you want to know what's going to happen in the next book. This is really, really helpful to me if you do. And um, otherwise, do me a favor and be nice to each other out there. Be nice to yourself. Be nice to yourself. It's very important. And I'll catch you next time. Bye.